Really glad to be back here. This is, I think, maybe the fourth or fifth presentation that I've, that I've given here at, at Walnut Creek. Always enjoy the opportunity to come across the state line and sneak in here incognito and no one knows that I don't have my big hat on. And like, wait a minute, I've seen that guy somewhere before. Um, and as Pam said, it's, it's always nice to see faces in the crowd that I've, I've seen before and new faces as well. I, I do recognize some people in the crowd. Uh, some that I've seen here when I've been giving presentations, um, others maybe at, uh, down in Tryon, I've given some talks down there and in Pearson's Falls and all kinds of other places. Um, so um, I do want to thank you for being here this morning. So my topic today, of course, is going to be on wildflowers and wildlife and really looking at the plant-animal interactions between the two. And there's some really fascinating things that, that take place in the natural world and, and they're happening right there in front of us, right beside us. We walk by things. Great example this morning, we got here and we were walking in, and we were moving some things out of the way where a little bit of pruning had been taking place. And I saw this laying on the ground. I was like, can I use this? And they're like, sure. So I picked it up and the first thing I noticed on it was if you look, there are these great big sort of cinnamon color spherical shaped objects on there. Big, big balls, if you would, on there. Big, yeah. Anybody know what those might be? Galls, yeah, G-A-L-L-S. And what is a gall? Good, it's an insect. It's a plant-animal interaction, okay? This animal, and certainly the female insect that came by, certainly interacted with this. This is just a leaf. That little brown structure you see is a leaf. But when that insect came by and communicated with this leaf, it wasn't as if it came up and had some verbal conversation. What it did is it had a chemical conversation. It killed him, didn't it? Well, it did. It did. It says, okay, I'm going to utilize basically one of your leaves, in this case two of your leaves, chemically change that leaf so that that leaf would begin to sort of ball up, and then inside it could provide a temporary home for that insect as it was developing into its next stage of life. What's this, the insect? Um, this particular one is one of the hymenopterans. Um, hymenopterans are the tissue wings. Hymenopterans are things like wasp, including non-stinging wasp. Um, and there are many, many different types of insect galls. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of that as we go through the presentation. But also notice on this big branch that there's been some other communication and interaction taking place as well. If you look at those leaves, it looks as if someone has been having a meal. Oh, yeah. yeah, you can see they've been chowing down on there. Here's a really nice one right in here. This is an insect called a leaf miner. And just as the name implies, it mines within the leaf. Goes down underneath that protective layer on the outside, gets down inside of there, and eats out the material that's in there. And there's lots of different types of leaf miners. As a matter of fact, some leaf miners are host specific. How many of you know what wild columbine is? Aquilegia canadensis. We'll see it during the presentation. There's one specific fly that only uses wild columbine to lay their egg in. That egg hatches into a little larva and that larva tunnels or mines through there to get the nutritional material. And it's really fun because when you look at it, you can tell where it went in and where it came out. In this case, on the lower end, it's real narrow. That's because the larva was little. But as the larva ate, what happened? It got big and fat, got healthy, got bigger, so the tunnel became bigger. It needed more space, but it also was consuming more of the plant material. So if you look closely on leaf surfaces, you'll notice there's no damage exteriorly. It's all underneath because the green material has been mined out of there. You can figure out where it came in, and where it came out. Almost all of our leaf miners in the Carolinas are all dipterian, some type of fly. Not common house fly like we're uh, more accustomed to, but it's one of the flies that are out there. All right, so let's get into this a little bit. Wildflowers, right? When we start looking at wildflowers, we, we see these beautiful colors that are out there. And what you and I see are these beautiful colors like purples and yellows and greens, intense bright reds of the pinkster flower. Anybody have any idea why you would call a red flower a pinkster? I don't know, we had to look ours 
up, we couldn't believe it. <laughs> I mean, we didn't. Yeah, it's like, you gotta be kidding me, that's not a pinkster, that's a redster. <laughs> it's a red flower. It's called a pinkster because it looks as if someone took a pair of pinking shears, those of you who might sew, when you cut cloth, you don't want to cut it at a straight edge because it'll unravel. So you use pinking shears, and it looks like someone took pinking shears and cut these around. All right? That shape is important in terms of who is going to visit, but that color is also important in terms of who this plant is going to interact with. We get nice deep reds and oranges in the case of like the flame azalea. Beautiful orange flower. How many of you have seen this in the wild before? It's, what, that's a perfect name for this one. While the pinkster might be somewhat like, I gotta do a little research, look it up in a book. This one, there's no doubt. If you see this out in the forest, it looks as if it is on fire. If a big flame is within the forest. Nice flames, they have beautiful orange colors that are out there for us to enjoy. But also look at these long structures coming out of there. How many of you have azaleas growing in your yard? Almost everybody has an azalea growing out there, right? Do the structures in the middle of those flowers look like these? Are they really elongated? No. No, not at all. But once again, this plant needs to be able to communicate with the community or the organisms that are within its surroundings. It's going to be important. We have nice yellows. Nice yellow colorations. By the way, is that a flower? It's a trick question. Uh, it's a composite, you got it. Um, this is one of the composites. It's got a great name. Green and gold. That narrows it down a lot, doesn't it? Because certainly there's only one wildflower that's green and gold. Okay. All right, so a green and gold, so we get greens and we get golds, we get reds, we get oranges. We also get purples and different hues of purples within the same plant. Notice we've got a sort of a light color, but these deep, deep purple colors toward the center. There's more blue in there. There's a reason for that. And then we get all the colors because white is all the colors, correct? If you take the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, mix them all together, you get white. White is all the colors. The advantage to having all the colors is visually you can communicate with a much wider range of wildlife. So why do flowers communicate? What is the purpose of communication of a flower with wildlife? Reproduction, Reproduction pollinization, fertilization, food, housing. Lots of different interactions are going to take place. But in the case of wildflowers, wildflowers have specific colors depending upon whom they're going to specifically interact with for the most part. Because there's a whole host of things that are out there in the daytime as well as at night that are going to interact with the different types of wildflowers we have. And here's that wild columbine, a drawing of wild columbine. You'll see an actual photograph later. Hummingbird in there, got a bee visiting in here, butterfly, Oop, there's a bat. We've got opossums, all sorts of things interacting with in there. So this idea of color can be a little bit of physics, okay? Are you ready for a little science lesson this morning? How many of you can tell I was a teacher for a while? <laughs> I've already asked you questions. <laughs> there will be a quiz at the end, so make sure you're following. All right? Well, we talked about the color white being all the colors within the rainbow, starting on the low energy side of red and working its way up to the high energy. And here in the middle is what you and I see. That's what's called visible light through here, okay? This is visible light. Maybe you've heard of something called UV light. There it is. So here's our visible light. This is UV. Below we have infrared. Now depending upon what you can see depends upon where you go and who you visit in terms of wildflowers. What color is that? Are you sure? 
Want to, st want to stay with that answer? It's yellow. <laughs> You're right, it is yellow. There's <laughs> a few people going, wait a minute. <laughs> it is yellow to you and I. So what we see is the energy level coming off of that. You and I project, or basically is projected on our eye. As that is the color yellow. This is the same flower. Now wait a minute, let's look at this again. Bright yellow, it's all yellow. There's no other colors there, right? Now wait a minute, it's not yellow anymore. And not only is it not just, no longer is it yellow, it now has these other dark colors in the center. If you were an insect, that is what you would see. Insects don't respond, we're gonna use the word see, we can't ask them, like, go to the butterfly and say, what color do you see? You have to do different experiments. And through these experiments, what we've been able to discover as scientists is that insects see colors on the UV end of the spectrum, the blue end. That's important, because when this animal comes by, this is under UV light, by the way, that's why you see it that color, because a UV light was shined on it so that what you see are the other colors that are there, and that's what an insect is gonna see. Now think about what that means in terms of wildlife and wildflower interactions. What a mammal sees is different than what an insect sees. What a bird sees is what a mammal sees in terms of color. That's gonna be important. So here's this little bee sitting out. This is a hymenopteron, by the way, on the tissue wing. Got these big eyes. What it's seeing through those big eyes, in this flower, you and I are seeing the color white. It's not seeing the color white. It's only seeing the colors that are on the blue end of the spectrum. So do you think flowers that are red in color are pollinated by insects? They can't see them. Now, how do we know this? It's a great classic experiment. They hung up these series of different colored lights, and they put light traps under the bottom of them. A light trap basically is so that if an insect flies over, it's going to come in, it's going to fall into a trap, it's going to spend the last portion of its life very intoxicated, because it's going to fall into alcohol. And, uh, and then it's going to basically be preserved. So there's all these lights strung out, everything red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Then you go back and you check. Based on what I just told you, here's your quiz. Which color do you think is going to have the greatest number of insects in the jar? Who said white? The white light. Yeah, because white's all the colors. Which one do you think would have the least a number? Red, okay? So we know that insects respond to different colors based on these experiments. Um, how many of you were here uh, to see Dr. Tim Spears talk uh, over the summer? Yeah, um, I was very fortunate to work with Tim on an experiment that, that he was doing looking at plant-animal interactions and uh, looking at butterflies, this big, huge greenhouse. We put all these different color flowers in there to see what color flowers the butterflies would visit. So one day you'd go in, it'd be all white flowers, and you'd go in the next day, it'd be all these different colors. And it was beautiful because the inside of the greenhouse kept changing. So all these different colors are going to affect what plants see them or what animals see them. So that's going to depend upon who's going to, who's going to pollinate you. All right? Do we see very good under red light? Mm -mm, no. So we don't put red lights in most things, do we? We use a white light because it gives us more coloration, or, or gives more coloration to the room, if you would. All right? Do we use that technology in any other ways, humans? If you want to get insects to come to something so they can be zapped and no longer flying around you, what color bulb do you put in? Red. You put a UV light in. You see them at nighttime, these big bug zappers, they're UV light. So UV light attracts those insects. They go over and they get zapped and they fall in there, okay? 
We use that technology in other ways, don't we? If you don't want a lot of insects flying around on your front porch, we put bug lights, don't we? We put yellow. How many of you have a yellow light bulb on your front porch? How many of you have ever seen a yellow light bulb? Yeah, so it, it doesn't attract as many insects. But if you want to make sure you have even fewer insects, what color light bulb should you put on your front porch? Red. Put your red light on your front door. <laughs> Now that creates a whole nother situation <laughs> of interactions. Because remember, you and I don't see well under the red light either, so that's not the color you want to use, okay? All right, so all that being said, there are scientific reasons why certain plants and animals interact with one another. So in this case, you're going to have a white flower and you're going to get lots of things, lots of things that visit them. If you look in the flower head, you're going to see there's some beetles in here. Here's another type of beetle, yet another type of beetle. You've got a bee with hymenopterans in here. So lots of different things visit it. Think about the advantage to that to the flower. You attract a much larger variety of pollinators, don't you? Is there an advantage to the insect? Sure, you can find the thing. You can see it. So white colored flowers are going to attract a greater diversity of insects. There's another example. This is one of my favorite plants. This is one of our native hydrangeas. This is called snowy hydrangea or white hydrangea, hydrangea radiata. And this plant goes a little further. Not only does it have white flowers, it produces these huge white petals so it can be seen and that's all that does is for attraction. They're infertile. They don't have the reproductive structures. It's these little tiny ones in here that you can barely see that are going to get pollinated. So the whole purpose of these great big ones that are around through here is just to attract the pollinator. But there again, plants that do this are plants that have white petals. Okay? All right. A little butterfly visiting in there. Once again, this is yarrow. It's a common plant we see growing in lots of areas. But is there a better way to communicate visually than just be one color? Obviously, the answer must be yes, right? <laughs> there you go. So we have white coloration in here, but look at the colors that are around the center of where the interaction between the insect and the flower, the whole purpose of that flower is going to take place. Flowers are for sexual reproduction. So the idea is here, not only have white and coloration so you can be found, but when you get here, concentrate your blues toward the center so that you attract the insect to move toward the center. Anybody know this particular plant? It is a trillium, very good. This is one as it appears and if it has been painted. So therefore it's called a painted trillium. Uh, North Carolina is very fortunate because there are more mountains in North Carolina than there are South Carolina. You have a much larger population of, of painted trilliums than we do in South Carolina. Currently there's only two known populations of painted trilliums in, in the state of South Carolina. North Carolina, we can go to lots of locations. Okay? Now the purpose of having this is these colors is to guide. You want to guide the insect to where you want it to go. Ah, now look what this plant has going on for its advantage. Whitish in color, sometimes a little bit of pink, but then you've got this purplish red color here, 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 and in the center. Notice how it's all a circle in its way. It's very sticky. And if you're an insect and you're attracted, these guides of color bring you straight to the middle and you land right there in the center. Anybody know what happens when you touch the center of a mountain laurel? It's spring-loaded. It wraps around you. Okay, it gives you a little hug. If you th all of these structures that are around here are all spring-loaded and when you apply pressure in the center, just the weight of that insect lands and all of a sudden all these things, boom, wrap around it. 
Yeah, and on the ends of each one of these is where all of the pollen grains are located. So now you came in, the main reason you came was you came to eat, you came to eat, you got a little bit to eat, but when you left you took some pollen, so when you went to the next mountain laurel flower and you went in there, you could then pollinate, transfer that material. Okay. So here's a whole nother type of interaction between an insect and a wildflower. It's being attracted by the light color, it's being guided to the pollen, which by the way, these patterns are called pollen guides. They're like the lights on the runway for a pilot to know where to land at nighttime. Okay? So if you think about it from that perspective, if you're flying an airplane at night and you're going to land, you want to land in between those runway lights. Okay? If you don't, it's going to be a little bit rougher landing. Well, it's true for the insect. When it's coming in, it's going to be guided in, land here, and then these organs are going to wrap around it. And that's an even better look right there. You can see, notice how this one's more white in color, but you can see those magenta colors through there. And the one prior to that is sort of a faded pink color, if you would. It takes a lot of energy, if you're a plant, to make color. It's a high energy expenditure. You've got to make extra food to make color. What's the purpose of having color to a flower? Attraction. For attraction. So that you get pollinated. But once you have been pollinated and that little pollen tube grows down and it's fertilized, a whole chemical reaction takes place within that flower. The chemistry completely changes and it gives a signal to the plant, stop wasting energy on making color. You don't need it anymore. So if you're no longer producing all the colors, is it going to stay white? No, it's going to start to fade, isn't it? And a lot of times it'll go to these hues of pink almost right away. An old botanist, and I say he's an old botanist because I went on one of his last wildflower uh, hikes that he lived in the uh, lived, let me try that again. One of the last wildflower walks that he led in the mountains of Tennessee, he was in his 80s, and he was there talking about it. And uh, we we're looking at it, and he kept referring to the blushing trillium. How many of you ever heard of a blushing trillium? I had never heard of such. Basically, what he said is the flower blushes after it's been kissed. Once it's been pollinated and fertilized, it goes to that pink color. All right? But for the plant, that interaction has nothing to do with our enjoyment, although we do enjoy it as it changes colors, it's all about survival and that interaction from producing a flower to making those colors so that that insect will interact with it all boils down so that there will be that same species for generation to come. Oh, you know this one, it's rhododendron. Look, we've got a little small hymenopteran in here, a little wasp. We've got a big bumblebee coming in here. And it, next time it, you go out and they're in bloom, which will be, we have to wait a little while now, but next summer, early spring, late spring, go look at rhododendron flowers. Almost every flower will have a petal at the top that has all of these little green dots. Look at that. Every one of them has little tiny green dots. If you want to make color, Green, what colors do you need to mix? Yeah, a little art science here, right? Eh? Yellow and blue. What color do insects see the best? Blue. Those are the pollen guys. So when he comes in, this guy's showing you that example. Is this interacting with this flower? It's going to come in here, and as it does, its body is going to be dusted by the pollen. If it lands down here, it's not going to get as much pollen on it. So this way, you get maximum coverage, if you would, by landing at the very top. So next year, you go in there and take a look at that. Now here's an example of, we see these everywhere. Um, there's large numbers and large diversity, um, but violets. And look, there are the pollen guides. Pollen guides guiding them in. Another one of our violets is bird's foot violet because the foot looks somewhat like, the, like a bird's foot. That foliage looks like a bird's foot. Purplish in color, so it's got some blue. 
but then toward the center, it's a little bit of a different coloration. But notice before you get to the center, you go from purple to white. The whole idea is making it more easy to see, so you move in so that these guys come. Now this plant has a whole nother strategy. It uses the color and the smell to attract. This is called pine sap. Uh, it's uh, a non-chlorophytic plant. You may, may know uh, Indian pipes. Indian pipes is a, is a um, a very close relative to this, sort of snow white color. But this one is called pine sap. There's another one that's called sweet pine sap or pygmy pipes. They're really tiny, tiny ones. But they're going to use smell. As a matter of fact, this one, not as much as odorata, which is the pygmy pipe, but they use smell. So it's a combination of color and smell. Most people find pygmy pipes by smelling them. They walk through the woods, they're only about this big and they're kind of brownish and purple. They're not very visible. It's not something you'd want to plant in your wildflower garden for a show of color. Most people who find them, find them by smell. That's also how wildlife find them, is by the smell. So we've got a whole other strategy coming in to begin those interactions. All right. This is a crab apple being visited by this beautiful little silver. Does everybody see that silver spot? That's not silver, that's white. I don't know why they call it a silver spotted skipper, but they do. This is a silver spotted skipper, which of course is one of our butterflies. It's being attracted to this by not only the color, but also the smell. Have you ever smelled apple blossoms before? Yeah, apple blossoms are really nice. Monarch butterfly. Ah, what's this? Is it a bird? <laughs> Is it a plane? Is it a butterfly? It's a moth. It's a moth. It's a moth that looks like a tiny hummingbird. So what do you call it? You guys are good. You come on up and do the talk. Get the talk. No problem. This is a hummingbird moth. And what it's doing is it's hovering around and it's visiting this flox. P-H-L-O-X flock. Okay, so it's visiting that area. Now back to our science lesson. Can I find my water? What color do mammals and birds see? All those colors, okay? Well earlier we said those insect, plant, animal interactions being color dependent, really we don't have red flowers that are pollinated or visited by insects. So who pollinates them? Oh. Birds. Birds respond or react to all of the colors within the visible spectrum. How do we know that? We did experiments. <laughs> How many of you have a hummingbird feeder? How many of you put red colored sugar water in it? Good. Most people don't. You don't need red colored sugar water. Once they find it, they know it's there. Okay? But the red makes it more visible to them. What a lot of people do is they'll plant red flowers in the area and then they will put the, um, the hummingbird feeder within that area. But if you notice, most hummingbird feeders will have the red color on there. Uh, either the glass that they're in, the plastic that's on them, the landing perching pad for them, but there's red so they can see it. So it's the birds in most of our red flowering plants that are responsible for the pollinization. And they are pretty serious about their job. Look real careful. That is the rump of a ruby-throated hummingbird that is getting way inside of this trumpet creeper. And I love this photograph, and I've used it in many, many different talks. But it was about a year ago. I'd probably used this 50, 60 times throughout the years. And I was talking, and I looked up there, and look in the middle. See that insect? And that's what happens 
when you stop and take a little closer look, you spend a little bit of extra time. It's like when I walked by, I saw those insect galls. I didn't see the leaf miner until I brought it in here. And when I was holding this up to show it to you, and you were looking at it, and as I was kind of talking, lo and behold, I looked on the very back up here, and yes, another insect gall by a totally different type of insect. I did not see that when it was laying out there. So the closer you look, the more you see. All right. So we've got this hummingbird in there, and this is a little beetle. I, I can't tell you which coleoptern it is, but because there's not much else to tell me what it is. All right. So birds are going to pollinate a red color for the most part. They also have that sort of trumpet shape to them, so they're going to be pollinated. Uh, our native honeysuckle. Anybody know this one? Coral honeysuckle, yeah. Yeah, this is a Pam picture, by the way. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> uh, Pam took this photograph, um, as well as this photograph, um, on one of the properties that uh, Pat has a, an easement on, and I don't remember the name. Oh, that's right. You own this one. See, she remembers where the photograph was taken. I just remember the photograph. Yeah. Um, but beautiful. And once again, as you look at that plant, there's that nice red color. Insects are not going to visit this by color alone. Therefore, most of them are pollinated by birds. But insects do visit these. Insects do visit other red colored flowers. But here's what they do. Here is Aquilegia canadensis, wild columbine. Notice how that these are hanging upside down. The hummingbird will hover up underneath, do a little pollinization. But look at these spurs up here. Those spurs contain the sugar water. An insect is not going to come in and, in most cases, do pollinization. It's going to come up through here and it's going to drill a little tiny hole right there. You can barely see that little tiny hole and it's going to rob the pollen. Seems fair. The wildflower tricked the hummingbird to come and pollinate it. Well, it didn't really trick it. It kind of gave it a reward. It gave it a food source. But the pollen robbers figured this out. They're like, we're not going by all that. We're just going to go straight up here, drill a little hole, get our meal, and go away. And the plant's like, wait a minute, you just took the nectar, but you didn't pollinate me. That's not fair. So those interactions become even more intricate as you, as you begin to look closer and closer. This is wild columbine and pollen robbers. Now this is a cool plant. Jack in the pulpit. Arisima trifylum for those folks who like scientific names. Okay. Look at the coloration in that sort of a purplish color. How many of you have seen them that are green? I've seen them green. Okay. All right. To get purple and to get green, what color do you need to mix in? Blue. Got to have blue to get purple. You got to have blue to get green. So there's, in a sense, are acting as pollen guides to bring that insect down inside. Because this is not the flower. That is not a jack-in-the-pulpit flower. That is a jack-in-the-pulpit flower. This is inside of the jack. These are the female flowers, and the males are inside of what's called the spadex up here, the, the jack, if you would. Okay, so here's the flower, and look at there. They're on their way in. This funnel shape is leading them down inside of the pulpit, that red coloration is pulling them down inside, guiding them in there. And the really cool thing is if you have a jack in the pulpit and you look very closely toward the bottom where the two modified, or the two sides of the modified leaf fold over, you'll see a tiny little hole right there. That's how you can tell if a jack in the pulpit is a male, a female, or both. Because this plant has a survival mechanism and has a plant-animal interaction mechanism called selective hermaphrodism. It can select to be male, female, or neither from year to year. 
It takes a lot of energy to be a female. I don't want to get any conversations about that. <laughs> All right? But reproduction takes a lot of energy. Okay? If you don't have a lot of energy to spare, you don't want to utilize that extra energy for your offspring, so you're not going to put on flowers. You may only put on male. If you really have no energy left, last year it just wore you out. You don't even put on a jack in the pulpit at all. It'll come up and you have the foliage. And that foliage is so it can photosynthesize, store more food, and if it does so successfully, next year does this, spends all that energy just to get an insect to come and visit it so they can carry on its species. But what about this one? It is. This one is probably the most perfectly named orchid. The spectacular or showy orchid. Orchis spectabilis. It's a scientific name. It is spectacular. Okay? And orchids have a really incredible adaptation. In other words, something that this physical, and in some cases behavioral, that's going to help that organism to survive. That's what I mean by an adaptation. It genetically inherited that material so that it puts on this long petal, or a beard if you would, that's a landing pad. If you want the insect to land here, what color do you produce there? Every color in the rainbow, or white if you would. Took a lot of energy to make that landing pad, but you don't need it back here, okay? But you want it to go back there, so you expend your energy in making colors that are blue to purple. You want it to land here and then go back into there. Okay. So they're pretty picky about who pollinates them. Not just any insect can find this, not just any insect can pollinate it, all right? There are other orchids that are just as selective, if you would, including the ladies the lady slippers. Yeah, this is pink lady slipper, one of our native orchids. You can see there's a little bit of a crease or seam through here. Not only does the insect have to find it, but it can find it because look at the coloration. There's sort of a pink in there, so it's going to find it, but it's got to find out how to get inside. And then once it gets inside, the female reproductive structures of this plant are inside of here just as are the male structures, the pollen, if you would. And they'll go in through the top, and this little crease has a little opening through here. Sometimes they'll come through and pop out the middle. Sometimes they will go back out through the top. But the whole idea is to attract them in there, get them to go down inside, and this is where the plants get even with the pollen robbers. No pollen inside of there. All that work by that insect to have a meal and got inside of there and there's no meal. So it's kind of back and forth in plant animal interactions. Sometimes one gets the advantage, sometimes the other gets the advantage. Uh, yellow lady slipper. We have two species of yellow lady slippers in the Carolinas. We have the large flowering, which is what this is, and we have the small flowered yellow lady slipper. Uh, this is in my yard. <laughs> yeah. Whatever did this is real lucky. I'm a naturalist. If we have all these insects out there, all these insects are being attracted to these colorful flowers. If they're not getting pollen, they still have to have food. What are you going to eat? They're going to eat the leaf itself, okay? So why is it even possible that we can have plants out there that still have any leaves left on them? There are billions, billions of insects. If we were to just go walk around Walnut Creek, we could find hundreds of thousands of individual insects out there and hundreds of different species. But do the plants still have leaves on them? Yeah. So this is sort of a normal cycle because there are things that eat the organisms that are eating the insects. 
what uh, sort of organism would eat a leaf-eating insect? Birds? Other insects? Yeah. Reptiles? And there's a lot of really cool parasites that love to eat bugs. And they basically make that insect its host, feed upon it. So here's an example of where on this one leaf, and we're going to see this in just a moment, you've got a whole, a pyramid, if you would, of a community. You've got the plant being eaten by the insect, the insect being eaten by another insect or another organism, and then that organism being parasitized by yet another. If any of those pieces are missing, that whole pyramid collapses. So these interactions are very important, not only to the plant, but also to the animal. Uh, you guys know this one. What is, what is this called? It went in right here and ate all over the place. It's a leaf miner. This is a leaf miner, okay? which I showed you an example of over there just a few minutes ago. And remember, in this case, it's not going to get every leaf. It's not going to eat every piece of it. And what it does is all of this can still photosynthesize, but this part basically can't. So these interactions at the leaf level, while it does reduce the ability for the plant to be able to photosynthesize because it has less surface area, but it does provide the opportunity for these. What is that? Caterpillar. Yeah. Anybody want to go for extra points? What's it going to, what kind of butterfly is it going to turn into? Monarch? There you go. Yep, it's going to turn into a monarch butterfly. When we plant our butterfly gardens, what do you plant? Milkweed. What else do you plant? Butterfly bush. You plant flowering plants, don't you? We typically, when we go into an area and we want butterflies, we plant food sources for the adult. We're providing nectar. But just as important to get a caterpillar to survive, it too must have food. It's not going to eat nectar and pollen. It's going to eat foliage. The perfect plant to attack butterflies, an oak tree. Over 500 different moths and butterfly species are known to use oak trees, either for the foliage or other parts of the plant for a food source. So if you want a butterfly garden, plant an oak tree. <laughs> well, think about in nature. Most of our butterflies are going to be here and be active when we have flowering plants, but there's time periods in which those plants aren't in flower. And once those butterflies lay those eggs and they hatch out into larvae, they have to have a food source at that time as well. So if you don't have a food source for the larva, the caterpillar, you're not going to get the adult out of there. Okay, look at this little guy. What reminds you of all those black and white stripes? A zebra. As an adult, certainly it looks like a zebra. Swallowtail. There are the swallowtails, and there is black and white stripes with that very characteristic red spot on the hind wings. But this is a zebra swallowtail, and even before it becomes an adult, it's striped or zebra-like. But the yellow is certainly more predominant. Good source of food for birds. You plant a butterfly garden, and you end up with incredible birds in your yard. You didn't even mean to do it. 
you supplied the plants for the interaction between the insect and the plant. Once the insects arrive, now there's a food source for a whole other group of organisms. And then you get into that animal-animal interaction. The birds feeding on the animals. Of course, birds feed on seed as well. So there's that whole plant-animal interaction at that level. So the zebra swallowtail. Well, we've talked a lot about plants utilizing insects for pollinization, for food sources. But do plants ever turn around and eat insects? Yes, they do. And if you look really careful, this is the flower. This is the pitcher. This is the backside of it. So we got, if we get a little closer, there's the flower. Insects got to come in here, get up in here, make its way inside for the whole pollinization to take place. But most interestingly to the majority of folks is what's taking place at the bottom of the plant. This is a pitcher plant, by the way. This one is mountain sweet pitcher plant, which is a listed species. Um, this is a different species, and I can't remember which one it is right now. It'll come to me in a moment. But think about the adaptations that all the other plants had for that plant-animal interaction between an insect or a bird and that plant. Colors, patterns. Well, look what this plant does. Red's not helping a whole lot, is it? Probably not going to be real easily seen. But if you look back in here, there's sort of like veins running through here. A little darker color. There's some purples in there, some blues. Look at these little hairy things. They're all pointing down. Down in the bottom of this is this very uh, odiferous material. Some might say it smells bad. Some may say it smells good. Who knows? So we'll just say it's odiferous. Down in the base, the insect comes in. It's attracted to this by the color, but it's also attracted to it by the smell. Remind you of anything you might have seen? I want to get gross. <laughs> Laying in the middle of the road. Roadkill. Yep, if that animal happened to have had some of its outer flesh removed, and so you're seeing muscle underneath there, and it lays out there in the sun for a little while, it starts to become a little putrid. That's why I said it has a smell. It's odiferous, because some might think that the smell of carrion is attracting. Others may not like the smell of rotting flesh. But in this case, this plant utilizes those strategies for the insect to come over. It thinks it's going to be able to feed on carrion. Comes in, drops down, starts making its way down, gets in and goes, wait a minute, this is not carrion. Turns around to try to leave, comes up through here, but here are all these little pointy objects bumping into it. It can't get out. It tries, it tries, it tries, eventually it falls down inside of here, and down inside of there is basically a very acidic solution, a digestive juice. It falls down inside of there, it begins to digest or break it down, then the plant absorbs the material up. Why not just photosynthesize? Make some chlorophyll, bring in some CO2, mix it with a little water, Plant food is sugar, but just like you and I, plants also have to have other nutrients. Where pitcher plants and other carnivorous plants, like sundews and bladderworts, and you guys are very lucky here in, in North Carolina to have um, the Venus flytrap, they all grow in conditions in which the soil does not provide the nutrients that they need in order to survive. They photosynthesize, they make sugar, but it's not enough for the organism to be able to survive. So the adaptation for that is they have this credible structure to attract insects to the plant and then the plant gets to eat. So here the plant has turned the tables. 
before the insect was eating the plant, now the plant is eating the insect. But there's a little bit of danger to that though. I want to back up. Notice that the flowers are really high up on this plant and the pitchers for the most part are a little bit low. You do not want to eat and digest your pollinator before it pollinates you. Think about that. Not to your advantage at all. All right. Everybody's brain doing all right? Is that too much for you? I've got more slides if you want me to keep going. <laughs> tell us more, tell us more. <laughs> no, I'm going to keep us on time. So.